Hello. Um, thanks for joining my session. And I believe we are ready to start. So I am going to talk about a slightly different topic um, to others, I guess. Um, and people who like music might enjoy it more than others. Uh, it is somewhat specific to that area, although my interest is in um, the general how AI gets used in the real world. So um, I would like to make a quick introduction about myself to begin with. Um, so I am currently COO at Cosmo. Uh, it's a funny spelling, but it's read Cosmo as well as a board member at S-Tile. I'm going to talk uh, more about my company later but what we do mainly is to find um, creative use cases for ai in the area of ai um, art and music in particular and that obviously closely relates to the topic that i'm going to be speaking about today and um, just prior to uh, being my current company i was the uh, ceo of data robot japan and that's where i had um, worked with hundreds of companies in um, solving enterprise problems um, in using AI. And I, I come to a little bit of that as well. But in, in general, um, in a sentence, what summarizes my interest and my passion is to build business around data and AI. And I have been working in my capacity uh, around my passion over the last 10 years in uh, different uh, disciplines of uh, business, art, and uh, many other things. And I believe it's easy to find ML, ML and data applications in any aspect of our society uh, these days. And um, since last year, as I joined Cosmo, I have been working more true to my passion. I, I really uh, love art and uh, music and um, my interest has been to discover what kind of uh, new possibilities we can find and build uh, around um, AI in those areas. So uh, this relates to uh, what I just said about me working at uh, Data Robot. As you know, Data Robot is an ML automation company and um, it works primarily with the enterprise uh, customers um, the, that um, was like around six years of my time uh, there I was pleasantly surprised to see that there were so many potential use cases uh, much more so than I thought in the beginning that influences the core of business that are in a diverse range of industries. And in Japan, in particular, where I am and my home ground is, some of the leading enterprise users of AI were manufacturing, where they use AI um, in many ways uh, in increasing production quality. And uh, also retail is a strong industry that I have a little experience with retail and CPG. Um, there's, uh, they are big user of AI primarily around demand forecasting. And I, it's not my intention to go into every other industry to talk about what their use cases are, but it, you know, I have no doubt that AI is big and bigger in terms of the impact it is making in the core of these business operations. <laughs> and the changes that I have been seeing in uh, enterprise and um, industries uh, obviously follows what happens in the internet where it is primarily data driven in its operation and it, you know everyone is a victim victim in a way of those AIs um, you know made to spend so much time on social network TikTok and you know that is in many ways <laughs> Uh, thanks to or in playing to uh, AI algorithms, but you know uh, we can focus easily on the good side of it too. And uh, like I just talked about, there are a number of very impactful use cases in the industries. And 
I have uh, worked in this area for a number of years and it has further led me to ponder how far we can take this in other areas. And that's the topic of today is those other beautiful things like art, music, uh, sports, any other thing. And that's my theme uh, looking back um, in the past decade is to find how we can cultivate use cases in these new areas. Um, and this, um, in case you are, um, I, I wonder how familiar you are in operationalizing uh, machine learning and AI. Um, you know, back in, let's say five years ago, uh, the, the lot of attention was in what type of model you can build with what kind of data. And a lot of companies started trying things out and try to figure out how it can actually be used in their business operations. And uh, we quickly discovered there's a lot more than just building a model if you are actually incorporating this technology into business operation. And that only then you can really see the impact and influence of technology. Uh, in your business. And sometimes the cost and effort required for operationalizing machine learning is so big and prohibitive compared to the expected value that it is supposed to create. Um, I have seen many companies uh, giving up on uh, going further than the POC phase uh, deeming that the result was unjustifiably um, marginal uh, to proceed. And of course, uh, as you may have seen, there are a lot of uh, ML2 vendors uh, who are trying to streamline this uh, to make it as easy as possible uh, without a lot of expertise on the human part. And But still, um, a lot of challenges remain that people need to incorporate a uh, new workflow using AI into the business operations. And there's a lot uh, for the user and the vendor and all the people that are uh, related to these projects to learn to uh, be better operationalizing. That's called MLOps uh, is the whole new industry that is taking off. Uh, as a result of so much potential that we have seen in the earlier years. Getting, moving in a little more into the meat of today's topic of mine, um, I'm gonna start talking about art and visual art in this case. And I think we are really witnessing in, and we are right in the middle of a historical moment for AI, even in the past few weeks and as we speak. I mean that in a really big way and probably much bigger than the hyped up uh, talks around uh, Web3 and all that kind of stuff, because this has the potential of really changing the internet as well. People may stop searching for some of the things, but start generating what they are looking for and that's quite, um, there's a lot of implications uh, for the web as a whole. And uh, from machine learning operations, MLOps perspective as well, I'm not saying that training and providing these models are trivial, right? For one thing, like uh, one of these models that came up in the last uh, couple of months was Mid Journey. I heard they used $80 million in electricity alone for training a single model. That's a single model, meaning, you know, usually uh, you have to build a number of models until you get it right. So that's the order of magnitude of money that's involved in this. But what I think is quite interesting is the way people are interacting with these models and quite directly. So uh, as the interface to 
input to these models are what we are quite familiar with, which is text. And you can just write what you want uh, for it to generate. And this enabled a lot of people to, uh, as I said, quite directly interact input and get output from the model uh, without these models being you know made into uh elaborate service right i think uh we are seeing something new here in terms of mlops and that something new has quickly turned into for example something like prompt base i was amused to see that people have started selling these prompts right which is a sentence uh a command, right? A uh, command may sound a little computerish, but it's just a sentence that specify what kind of image uh, you want. Uh, that tends to work well for these models. And, you know, this is a marketplace in case you don't know where your prompt can be sold for something like, you know, a few dollars. Uh, but it's, it's quite um, intriguing to see that um, what these models can do. And you'd start to wonder, oh, I want to know what prompt people had put it put into the model and that that's here you can buy um and then you can everybody can sell so that's the level of engagement right that um there is with these models and then i saw probably a few days ago right um some people have taken this further and using an evolutional computational techniques to find um sort of in a more automated fashion to discover what are the uh, languages that will produce more aesthetically pleasant images and you know clearly they have some way of measuring aesthetics uh you know coming there, there are researches like that and the data is there to do that depending on what you mean by aesthetics but one of the images that was created by uh, this image and you know it's it's a quite complex thing we are talking about here is human creativity for one. And there's, you know, a lot of arguments around copyright or ethics or whatnot, but uh, there's a huge interest that's happening now in this and quite interesting from an ML ops perspective too. Uh, one, one of the results from this guy who was uh, optimizing these um, prompts uh, that I saw was quite, cool was um, this one uh, i mean the image is uh, interesting to say the least but more interesting is sorry about the noise the neighbor is doing some construction work but uh, look at the prompt right and i didn't think it was english but apparently all the words here are in some english dictionary that that's because he sourced the words from English this dictionary and you know uh, used algorithm to optimize the selection to make more interesting image and that's really pushing things far and uh, I, I'm very amused by that um, you know somebody like a user of your model is engaging with your model so much so that it pushes the model to the limit and you know getting interesting insight uh into what we can do in interacting with ai and that's basically uh the topic of my my talk today and uh topic of my talk is uh music right um because um we like music hopefully you do too and it's one area of art uh that has a lot of potential of ai application as well as we believe and as a company at cosmo we work on a lot of projects around music by itself and with uh, some of our customers and uh, we set out early this year to uh, comprehend uh, in the world what's happening around ai and music and wrote this uh, white paper, which summarizes um, the state of the art of AI development uh, that are associated with uh, music generation in a broader sense. Uh, I will come to that more detail, but we reviewed what kind of 
um, technologies. There are changes of technologies, uh, kind of potential uh, there is in applying these technologies to business and what kind of social implications there are and the concern uh, as well in uh, more and more application of these technologies uh, pop up. And it's, it's a free uh, white paper. And if you Google search uh, the title of the white paper, you'd quickly find it. It's available both in Japanese and English. So um, if you are interested, please uh, take a look. And I, I will um, talk uh, some of my findings from this um, white paper to begin with. Right. Um, so if you uh, talk about music generation, you know, all kinds of different techniques have been tried that uh, some of you AI engineers would most likely have heard. And it has been in the path of evolution and transformation over the time. And, you know, just to give you some idea, uh, you know, um, I think it was 2017 that uh, uh, Google Magenta did performance RNN. It's uh, an earlier form of uh, deep learning architecture that was uh, initially used for um, language modeling. And interesting to find out that language modeling and music modeling is quite similar because you know you have this order, a sequential order uh, structure in music like uh, language, and that has a, a quite good um, match uh, between the technology and the subject. So, for example, uh, this model was good at modeling single instrument. So, in this case, piano. Yeah, I, th I think it's uh, pleasant to listen to, right? And uh, the input to this is. Uh, starting melody, so you put like you know five or six notes uh, to the model and it starts playing the rest for you, right? And there's some random element to it. So every time you try with different random seed, you can get different variations of uh, the music. Um, the music gets generated by MIDI. MIDI is something like score, right? By itself doesn't have a sound, but gets connected to the sound source. In this case, a piano uh, model sound source, and you know it sounds quite um realistic uh because these uh sound sources are pretty well done uh these days and uh you know it's it's very important that you get both the score and the sound source right for the music to sound pretty good but this is just for a single instrument now uh if you go further um into using GAN, this is probably a year 2018 you know some people obviously try to extend this to multi-instrument and this is what happened yeah uh, may maybe you might have different opinions about how you felt about this music. It sounds a little artificial to me, uh, but it it's a good try, right? You know, in, in a single go, it, it generates multiple tracks representing different instruments. And, you know, this is just one of many models. GAM, by the way, has been known in the area of uh, image generation, but there hasn't been a lot of example of that using music, in fact. And then further, uh, I think this was uh, 2019, right? Um, OpenAI uh, did this thing called Jukebox. And this time they didn't generate MIDI, this time they generated audio uh, sounds like wave file uh, directly and sounds like this. And even has this clapping in the beginning, right? Somewhere that I've heard of once in the world. Yeah, so some of you might have heard this, right? Because it was uh, quite um, big and talked about back then. Um, it's quite impressive, right? It even got the voices 
uh, in it, which is you, you can never get voices out of MIDI, so it's you know quite a leap uh, by itself. There's you know a lot of limitation to it, though it would only generate music for the artist that it already knows, for the genre it knows, right? But you, you can do some crazy stuff like you know Frank Sinatra singing in the style of reggae and you know things like that, and you can even give it like a random lyric to you know make him sing so uh, it was quite groundbreaking and impactful from that perspective uh, the quality of sound is okay although like not like super and generation tends to take quite a long time even for a short segment of the music and in the beginning i talked a little bit about image generation and you know the talk of the town is the diffusion model right it's a new architecture that seems to be doing quite a lot for image generation and people are starting to work uh, with this in music as well. I don't think this has matured as yet, but there was a recent paper by the Google Magenta team on generating uh, audio sound with MIDI input, right? So it's sort of like replacing the sound source part with an AI. And that's actually a quite uh, tricky part that is, is hard to remove human out of in sound design and assigning which sound to which track and so on. And it can do that. Uh, automatically. Um, let's take a listen. Right, so you know, considering it was purely generated from the model, I think it's there's some uh, way of uh, it is impressive, but um, I, I think the quality-wise, there's still a lot of room for improvement. I'm sure there's a lot of improvement to come over the um, years or even weeks, probably. So you know, that's if you are talking about uh, generating uh, music as a whole, and these models have been trained on various different types of data, right, that people have found. Although, like, there's not been a killer app yet, like, you know, mid-journey, daddy to stable diffusion level of uh, excitement as yet. And, you know, there's a number of reasons for that. There's not as m much of data that are in, well prepared for this type of training uh, although people are starting to talk about like you can type in the kind of music describe that in text and the music gets generated that kind of system um I, i'm not sure if that is coming it, it, i don't think it's around the corner right it's still going to take some time and it, even then I, i'm not sure if i would listen to it on a daily basis but i want to just widen the perspective a little bit right because uh, music generation is not just generating the entire music there is also researches around generating patterns um, also generating sounds as well and there is different pros and cons uh, for different approaches uh, like sound quality uh, diversity of what can be generated novelty of what can be generated as you all know machine learning is not typically very good at generating something very new but if you are generating parts of it then in the interaction between human and ai you can start to create something new um, some of that these algorithms don't work in real time uh, some of them do and some of these algorithms can be interacted with in real time versus some that are not so um, understanding that there is no like killer app killer um model that does everything um but still there's an interesting area to explore and quite frankly replacing human musicians is not that fun right uh you know in in any way i would be more interested in finding out how creativity can be advanced a human creativity can be advanced in combination with AI. That's uh, what interests uh, me and us as a company. And there's a number of potential paths that exist for operationalizing AI for music performances. Uh, like, as I said, uh, you can be playing something by yourself, but the sound gets generated by 
AI. Um, AI could be generating MIDI and then you could be assigning your sound source to it and such and such. There's different interaction point in the whole chain of ML op operationalization when it comes to uh, music uh, creation. And uh, just like to show you as an example what uh, we do at Cosmo, uh, which is a project called um, AI DJ. It's, it's a 10 minute video, so I'm, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit. So there's a lot happening on that deck. And one of it is that, uh, you know, um, now who is playing this as a DJ, he plays a record, but also alongside with the um, AI generated rhythm patterns and bass lines. So the way it works is AI generate rhythm patterns and bass lines and melody samples. And human DJ selects patterns and assign sound uh, source to each. And um, in, in this case, sound sources are not um, AI generated typically. And then in real time, uh, the DJ mixes and dubs audio channels to create musical development over time. And also the model is built in such a way that the output of the performance influences the next round of the generation. So uh, that's what I am calling MLOps uh, for musician uh, in the works right here uh, in one way. Another, uh, this time, is a tool that we developed for musical performance. Um, let's have a look here. So here you're more directly interacting with the latent space of the GAM model that was trained on different rhythmic patterns that are trained in two bars. So it, it you know, you cannot generate very long stretch uh, of music uh, with GAN and high quality as yet, but you can, you get the idea, you can start to generate uh, two bars of a rhythm and then you can start to explore by changing the input, which is a random number in representing a you know, vector in latent space, and then you can start to morph around your rhythm as you change the input uh, gradually. And you can use multiple of these, for example, and mix them together and develop, you know, music uh, over time. And, you know, this has actually been used in actual dance parties and clubs. And, you know, usually people don't even, um, won't be able to tell if it's AI, right? I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but like it is to the level that it's indistinguishable and quite fun to dance to as well. Um, in, in this case, it does require a GPU to run it, um, but it does work in real time, uh, which is a quite in, important element of performing arts. And uh, I would also talk about uh, recent development in sound synthesizing, that especially last year, there has been a, a lot of development around uh, real-time audio synthesis at high quality. High quality in these cases, meaning 48 kilohertz, you know, it's like better than CD level uh, quality. And, you know, this technology uh, such that they will run on a generic CPU hardware and, um, you know, quite efficient at generating. Input to these models are, uh, it's, it, these are timber transfer, timber transfer models, meaning that you, play something or oh, it could be a voice right and your sound gets uh, converted into something else uh, let's take an example of that <laughs> Yeah, so uh, you know, in Japanese there are these sound words, right? Um, so like drums, people describe as doko 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 tsk 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 tsk, and that readily gets. This is a you know live performance 
and that already gets ex um, transformed into an actual drum sound. In this case, some um, traditional uh, drum of Middle East. And, you know, we saw a lot of potential uh, in creative performances using this. Another example of the same model, uh, actually same architecture, but different model uh, trained on voice, right? So the input to it is, and then for some reason you might want to convert it to a voice, right? Right, so uh, that's a quite funny sounding, but you know, interesting as an experimental phase, right? Uh, the DDSP is a slightly different approach and is uh, better for monophonic instrument. Monophonic is when, you know, only single sound is playing at, at the time, so it's not chord. So, for example, you can change the timbre of violin, which sounds like this. and turn that into shakuhachi, which is... So we built these models and were totally astonished and mesmerized for how Good they sounded after the processing and you know also amazed by the fact that they work in real time and started to realize the implication of it for um, musical performances and wanted to really make more of this uh, to happen. The problem was that it was not really operationalizable for uh, the users that we were uh, intending, which were musicians who uh, may use something like this software called DAW, Desktop Audio Workstation. You know, nowadays a lot of musicians use this kind of system. Um, you know, it's, it's a good UI, and this particular one is called Ableton Live. But, you know, using the model is painstaking, right? Just uh, building the model requires a GPU. That part requires a GPU and takes five days or so to train. And, you know, even after the model has been there, running it requires Python coding. And, you know, like this is totally not appropriate for um, real-time application. And for people who could build models, they are, you know, typically researchers who are not that into engineering and developing uh, software, usually called plugin, that runs on uh, this desktop audio workstation is a quite, requires a lot of experience and knowledge to do. So that's why uh, we decided to introduce this uh, plugin, AI audio plugin called Newton. Um, uh, around end of May in a community approach, which I will come to. And the idea is to narrow the gap between the mus musician users and the uh, AI researchers uh, from both sides. Uh, let's take a look at that quick short video here. So ho hopefully you get the idea, right? So we are trying to narrow the gap that exists, um, mainly coming from the technical barriers from both end of the users, right? Musicians on one end and AI researchers on the other. We can both benefit from uh, this product. 
and uh, we have built this plugin that looks um, like this that can directly run on top of uh, music workstations um, on a regular uh, platform like Mac. We actually still develop in the Windows version, uh, which is a long story. Uh, but anyway, and uh, building the model, we eventually want that to be so easy that any musicians can do at the moment it isn't and we're trying to build a community of ai mm -hmm. researchers who would be contributing uh, their models uh, to this platform for use by uh, people who are on the creative side and you know that's really uh, the core of the point of uh, mlops here is that there is a very big disconnect between the research community and the creators community at the moment although like we have seen with the image generation model if the interface gets so streamlined a lot can happen that will engage the users with the ai and you know we're happy to see some professional musicians also starting to be involved uh, in this effort let's just quickly take a look at one of these artists yeah so clearly he's a wizard in playing keyboard and he is a professional musician in the jazz modern jazz field called big yuki and you know he's been working with us on his new album using Newton and getting a lot of uh, inspiration from it. You know, both sides are like he is working for him as a musical inspiration is working for us as a way of figuring out how best to um, take this tool to the next level. And, you know, that's what I come back to is it is our dream to have our model users engage with it. So far that it will push uh, push these uh, tools to the limit, right? And uh, I think that's the excitement of MLOps in connecting the technology with the real world. And I know this is a specific field uh, of music that we are looking at, but I hope that uh, you have felt some of that excitement that would, you know, um, be the same for whatever field you are working at. It is so fun when you know things actually get used and uh, make difference to the world. So uh, that uh, more or less concludes uh, my talk today. Um, uh, I do want to go to the next slide. Yeah, a uh, lot of people ask us. So this is all fun and music, but how do you make money well that's a good question and <laughs> you know this uh too we are providing for free now but yeah we are looking at uh eventually commercializing it and uh, finding a monetization point but for the most part at cosmo uh, we work with enterprise customers uh a lot of them are in the field of music or um, related uh, for example pioneer dj who has a um, dominating market share uh, in the dj equipment we work with them to develop some of their algorithms and so on so that's just last slide of advertisement if there is anybody who needs help in uh, using this type of technology for your own services or product please let us know and we can work on a core R&D project, for example. And we have uh, quite a number of existing licensable algorithms as well for you uh, to use in a commercialized um, products. So that's what we do. And 
it is the end of my talk. So thank you very, very much for um, staying with me to the end of the talk. And I'd be happy to take any questions if you have them.